Hello, and thanks everyone for joining this latest episode of Growth Busters. And for those who may not have listened in before, this is the latest in a series of what we're calling bite-sized conversations with a variety of B2B experts exploring key challenges that many B2B marketing and salespeople we speak to are focused on solving today. My name is Paul Gibson. I lead the charge for demand base outside of North America, and I'm the host for this series. In today's topic, we're actually diving into a really big um, thing right now, something everyone's talking about, intent data. And today we're going to explore some of the common misconceptions about intent, highlights the importance of detailed intent over black box solutions, helping you chase non-leads, which is no good uh, for anyone, or killing deals before brand trust is even established. If you don't get the right intent data, it's worse than having no intent data. So from this session, you'll gain a, a deeper understanding of intent, how it can impact your sales and marketing efforts. And I'm pleased to say to support today's important discussion, I'm excited to be joined by uh, someone who's both an experienced marketer and a bit of a sales engineer guru, um, Matthew Cheeseman. Um, Matt, it's great to have you on the session today, and I'm really looking forward to our discussions. I, I, I know we've worked, to, worked together for some time, and, and the way you can actually relate technology to business problems is I think quite exceptional. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say today. But before we get started, it'd be great for the listeners to hear a little bit about yourself, how you found out about Demand Base and your journey to where you are today. Yeah, amazing. Well, thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me uh, on the show here. Um, good afternoon to everyone or good morning, depending on, on where you are. Uh, Matt Cheeseman, as, as Paul mentioned, I'm a sales engineer here at Demand Base. So I sit more on the, on the technical side of the house, but actually my, my background has been in marketing or so for the past 10 years. I um, was at a MarTech consultancy prior to this, helping companies really get the most out of CRM and, and marketing automation platforms and really joined Demand Base because it's the next step, right, on that on that kind of go-to-market journey of marketing technology maturity that a lot of companies are on. Once they uh, get to a stage of CRM and, and marketing automation, it can only achieve a certain amount the next logical step is uh, is a tool like demand base, and so I thought I'd, I'd join the company uh, rather than just buy the technology itself at my previous company. So yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. Fantastic, yeah, and it's great to have you as part of the team. I've made a real difference since you've joined us. I think this this should be a really useful session uh, for our listeners. It's I think we've all seen a huge spike in interest, the importance of intent, and much of it's been driven by you know the COVID epidemic, which meant an enter trade shows, field, of, field events, face-to-face -face meetings, all that sort of stuff where you were finding your opportunities. And it turned out that it was only you know intent data that could help uncover those buying signals that were otherwise being missed. But what's interesting, I think, much of the comment and research that I've seen recently has been quite generic. You know, intent is this mysterious thing and often nothing more than a function feature checklist to identify what's good and what's bad while not really digging into the detail, the importance of accuracy of the data, the relevance of the intent to your business, and the underlying business impact, impacts that can deliver. So I'm really hoping we can dig into some of that today, Matt. And, and we'll start with a simple one, I hope. Um, I've heard maybe a million different definitions of intent. So from your perspective, how would you explain what intent means in the context, perhaps, of, of sales and marketing teams? Yeah, I mean... When we think about just the word intent, right, the definition of it, it can mean many different things, I think, to many different companies and many different marketing and sales teams out there. And the way that I kind of break it down when I talk to customers is you have intent data and, and intent data providers, but you also have data which would otherwise be intent to buy. And that can include intent data. I think when we, when we think about intent data, it's kind of traditional form. Essentially, it's everything that's happening outside of a company's website. Uh, when we think about that buyer journey, we've all read the stats, and I think it's up to 80 and 90 percent now of, of that buyer journey happens without talking to a, to a sales or, or marketing team at an organization. Intent data is there to unlock that. You know, what's happening off a company's website that would indicate that there is a company that is in market for a company's products or solutions. Uh, and alongside that, you have intent to buy, which might include things like web visits and uh, marketing automation data. Uh, but really, when we think about the definition of intent, it's important that every company has that definition. Um, and everyone's going to have a bit like a lead. Right? Everyone's going to have a different vision of a lead. Um, I think the same is true of intent. But really, intent data is anything happening off your website 
outside of your brand's uh, engagement today. Uh, that's really what we mean by intent. Fantastic. Yeah, that's not nice and simple. And it sounds like in reality, you know, intent could be a multiple different things. But from your perspective, what di different types of intent would you consider those that are relevant for B2B businesses today? Yeah, you know, I think when you're thinking about it from a from a vendor perspective and you're hearing vendors talking and, and in the space of, of intent data, um, that's really where well, we have it's kind of two different types of intent data providers. One is those that capture it through publishers where they can track and identify companies uh, reading certain content and these providers will have partnerships with those publishers to, to track intent. And on the other side of that is what they call um, bid stream intent, which is actually where those intent data providers don't need the partnerships with the publications. And actually they can capture that directly through advertising technology or, or DSPs, demand side platforms, which really open up millions of publisher pages uh, in order to, to track and identify companies based on IP address that are reading certain topics and articles and those keywords. Um, and, and that's the, the two definitions there, I guess, are yeah, bitstream intent and those that get it through the publishers. But in thinking about that from intent to buy and intent data is a part of that, when we think about the intent to buy, that's able to look at other signals such as what's happening on a company's website and then what might be happening through traditional forms of marketing automation like email opens, email clicks, form submits, you know, MQLs it is all going to go into that intent to buy and intent data is a part of that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I suppose knowing someone's in market is great. But if you can then combine that with knowing if they're engaging with your brand or not, it helps you when you're building that, that strategy, right? Oh, they're in market, but right now they've not engaged with our brand. There's no point throwing that to sales, right? It's far too early. You need to get some brand awareness in there. So that combination obviously makes sense. A lot of conversations we have, intent is seen as something used for the demand gen function. So finding prospects, opportunities, that sort of thing. But in my experience, and certainly with the customers that I work with, it's just as important for your existing client base. So you need to identify perhaps when they might be at risk of churn or the researching competitors, or maybe there's a cross-sell, upsell opportunity. Can you give us some thoughts on some simple intent methods that marketers can use today for, for both of those different ideas? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thinking about where those accounts are in that buy journey is, is critical and intent data and intent to buy data kind of uh, plays a critical part in that. But if you think about that net new, those accounts that aren't already customers of yours and perhaps aren't on your website yet, right? it's critical to know that. And if the intent data is suggesting that they are reading relevant keywords and that they're in market, perhaps they're reading about competitors, that is definitely an account that you want to start to engage with, right? Start marketing and sales prospecting into. But what about those, to your point, to your point there, Paul, right, of existing customers, maybe there's a renewal coming up in, in three to six months, and all of a sudden there's a big spike in, in your competitors that the account is actually reading about outside of your website, outside of all the typical things that the company might be tracking. Well, that's where you definitely want to be notifying the, the customer success team uh, you know, and other departments perhaps outside of just sales and marketing that are critical to, you know, keeping renewal rates up in, in this type of market and climate that we're in, that is critical. And so all the way through that buyer journey, intent data can play a really critical role in, in making sure that companies not only acquire business, but also retain it as well. Yeah, that's great. And and I think that buyer journeys is is probably more important than a lot of people put weight against. I mean, you take your time, you know, if it's someone who's just getting started, giving a call to action to them is too early. If you so know someone's heavily engaged with sales, you can get that really relevant white paper in there. So I think buyer journeys is something that, that often is overlooked. And plain, uh, shameless plug, our next session is all around buyer journeys. So uh, keep an eye out for that one when we're, we're talking. That's our next LinkedIn Live. So anyway, um, that was a shameless plug. There you go. So intent sounds... Probably something that, if we're honest, any B2B business would struggle if they didn't have. So, you know, you could miss lots of buying signals from prospects and customers that we just discussed. So from your perspective, Matt, and, you know, the experience you've got working with clients, how best can businesses identify and measure intent in their own target audience? I think there's there's a couple of things there. Again, if I 
I keep referring to this intent data versus in, intent to buy, just to try and demystify the word intent, uh, if I may. It's, it's utilizing all of those different signals, which could be intent data, but it could also be you know, your web visits that can be de-identified. Any data that's been brought in from marketing automation in terms of those email clicks, the opens there, the form submits, the content downloads, et cetera, that, that marketing automation is, is tracking. It's important to actually have that all in one place. You know, often with CRM and marketing automation, e even those two platforms often aren't always integrated the best and there's gaps that are missing. And, and platforms like Demandbase and others are very good at kind of bringing all of that data together in, into one place to actually understand what is the intent to buy in that particular account and making sure those accounts, you know, again, teeing up those, that journey stage um, discussion that you have next, Paul. But it, it is critical. And all those data points are going to go into that. And we think about those accounts that are in CRM as an example, that are already existing customers, well, we're going to map to that, you know, and, and those accounts that are top of funnel, that are showing relevant buying signals, reading those keywords off your website, the intent data, but they're not on the website yet, you're going to treat those accounts very, very differently and also score all of that activity very differently as well. And so being able to do account-based scoring and to fuel that, that journey stages and to understand and identify uh, and measuring all of that intent is also critical to that too. Yeah, yeah, great, great insight. Thank you. I know it's, it's interesting. One of our clients, who remain nameless, is a, is a very well known ERP provider. And I saw one of the use cases where they were great at selling their ERP. And then someone come to them and say, oh, We bought this other CRM system. Can you help us integrate it? When they had their own fully integrated CRM system. So they sit there and listen. And if one of their customers who's using one part of their product shows any interest at all in CRM, they get in there and they, they make sure that they know that CRM is something they offer. They don't always win, but they're always in the deals now. So I think that that is a really good use case. So just changing tack slightly, a lot of people think of intent as something that marketers use, but actually it's hugely valuable for salespeople. I've heard some horror stories recently talking to some salespeople at a recent event, and it seems some of them have actually lost faith in intent. Uh, they're being advised to target accounts that aren't actually in market or not showing signals that are relevant to the messaging they use. And that's really damaged the sales and marketing alignment in their own businesses. So if you can, to try and help, can you discuss the difference potentially between a black box solution and detailed intent data and, and the benefits to a business? Yeah, I, th I think it's about making sure that you have a, a kind of ABM platform, a platform in general that can give you the control over the activities that are being scored uh, and making sure that you're not just sending across accounts that maybe have done minimal activity and you're sending that across the sales because as you mentioned earlier Paul right it's, it's far too far too early and if you think about that from a marketing automation perspective in the kind of world that perhaps a lot of listeners are in today someone fills out a form or maybe download some content and get sent across to the sales team. You know, that is going to be far too early in that in that buying journey potentially too. Um, but just going back to that black box, well, if an account is starting to show intent, i.e. they are reading those keywords off of your website, is that a time for the sales team to get in touch? You know, some of them, some of our customers and some companies out there may decide, yes, now is a great time. They're showing intent, they're reading those keywords let's fast track them for sales, but others may not want that, right? May, others may say that's far too early. Maybe there needs to be a web visit first. There needs to be perhaps some kind of content download before that does actually go across, uh, you know, in combination and, and goes across into the, into the sales team. But just having control of that is critical, not just sending that across to some AI machine learning, like a black box solution, just to input and then spit out accounts almost at random. You need to make sure you have enough control over that because you mentioned it there, Paul, right? Sales and marketing alignment is, is absolutely critical. And that goes into the data that's sent across to the sales team and having control over that data and that process, uh, you know, it's critical to make sure that you keep that sales and marketing alignment and, and that relationship stays strong. Yeah, great points. And I think if, you know, having relevant buying signals, keywords that mean something to your business actually irrelevant that you can get the messaging out there it makes much more sense than 
this black box intent idea, which just throws out irrelevant, undefined insight. Doesn't seem to make any sense to me, but um, that, that's something that we can help with for sure. Anyway, we're talking about sales at the moment, so let, let's keep on that thread. And we know from experience that many sales teams spend quite a big percentage of their time actually researching rather than going out there and selling. And often they end up chasing opportunities that maybe aren't a good fit. Maybe the business don't want them to sell them. Um, perhaps they're not even in market. So if you don't mind, Matt, can you discuss some potential pitfalls of not considering intent from a sales and marketing perspective and what could be missed? Yeah, I think there's probably a lot of listeners out there today that are perhaps experiencing this, that those companies that have that traditional marketing sales outfit where marketing throw leads over the fence to, to the sales team and marketing are saying, why are you not following up on these leads? And the sales team are saying, why, why are you sending these irrelevant leads over? Right? They're, they're companies that we, we're never going to sell to. I think if you're experiencing that and you're listening to this, then that is a sign of a pitfall of, of really not, not considering intent because what intent can, can bring you is actually, well, is this account now a good fit? And the key part there is the account, right? We're not just throwing a person, an, an individual over to the sales team. It's making sure that account, the buying committee within that account are actually in market. Uh, and there is something happening in that account, which means now is a good time uh, to actually start following up. Um, and so if you are experiencing that and you're, you're throwing leads over the fence and there is a, a bit of friction there between the two departments, then that's a sign that something like intent can, can definitely help there uh, improve that relationship for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, nothing worse than going into a sales and marketing meeting where sales are saying that the leads are rubbish and marketing saying that sales are rubbish because they can't close them. So anything that can help that is obviously beneficial. And I know from talking to, to some of the prospects that, that we're speaking to at the moment that they may be using a, a lesser intent platform, perhaps that some crazy things are actually being measured to identify that a company's in market. Uh, for instance, if an SDR emails a prospect multiple times, the emails are never getting opened and they're not being responded to, but they're still adding that intense score and it's being seen as in market. It makes zero sense uh, to me, but from your perspective, what intent is measured that should be included and, and equally, you know, what shouldn't be? So, you know, try and get your, your take on it from experience with customers. Where is it actually buying intent and where isn't it? Yeah, I think this kind of this kind of touches upon a lot of things we've talked about already, really, which is around one having control over the kind of scoring and, and all the intent to buy uh, type data points that we bring together and, and aggregate. Um, and you know, having, having control over that is, is is really critical. In that, if someone's emailing and an SDR, for example, as put in sales loft or an outreach cadence and there's lots of emails that are that are being sent out well unless something happens back like there's a some kind of reply a positive response you know you don't really necessarily want to be scoring that, that that's not engagement that's that's um you know from the customer or prospect back to the brand that's just a, a lot of outreach and and again having control over that again is, is the real critical point and an example there if we think about intent that's being measured when we think about that intent data, again, that offsite, the keywords that a company is reading about, using that to fuel advertising, for example, those employees in that company reading that keyword, you know, those are the people that we want to target and, and be in front of. Um, and it's the intent data that we, we want to measure all those keywords and the activity. We want to measure the website, track all that activity that companies necessarily aren't, aren't tracking and uh, today, the marketing automation, Salesforce activities, or anything in CRM, we want to be tracking. All, all of that can go into what we call this kind of intent to buy, and the intent data is, is a part of that. But again, the critical point there is being able to control that. Every company will want to score different activities differently based on their go-to-market and the markets they're in. Um, big element there is, is control and transparency, right? That's, that's the critical element to this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you, you've hit the nail on the head there. And if, some, if, if someone sends me an email and I unsubscribe, I don't expect that to be seen as a, a, a buying signal. That's a dead lead in our world. Right? You know, some, some technologies might see dead people, but, but I don't know, the mail base doesn't. Um, 
Anyway, there's there's always innovations just as we're coming towards the end of this session that, that potentially change the ecosystem and the marketplace overall. Things like chat GPT, uh, flavors of the month right now. So, you know, that's something everyone's talking about. But I'd be interested in understanding how you would see the role of intent potentially evolving and if that will have an effect in the future, the way sales and marketing works. Yeah, I, I think we're already kind of seeing that transition. Um, I've been at Darbase probably 18 months and starting to see the transition more and more. And I can't help but feel it's keep going to keep going that way. Right? I mean, think about the way that consumers buy now and their, their activity online. People are filling out forms less and less. And I think this world where everything is open, it's ungated, tools like demand base to, to kind of de-identify the web traffic, which would be some element of, of intent to buy, the intent data itself, right, off-site activity. I think all of these data points are going to move us away from this, the classic MQL lead-based approach. I do think that is that is where intent data and this intent to buy that we bring together it is going to completely, completely revolutionize that. Um, those, those form fills. Um, and I think we're starting to see that already. I think other companies out there, when they look at their traditional sales and marketing funnel and they see maybe tracking web visits through to form fills, they'll be seeing that conversion rate, you know, get lower and lower. Um, and tools like demand base and others out there, I think it can really help um, evolve and, and plug that gap. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It might just be me, you know, sitting here talking to you, but intent has always seemed, in my mind, a bit, you know, a bit mysterious. It's that black box, that magic thing that go after that account, but I can't really tell you why or that sort of stuff. But you're you're making a really good case for a transparent, you know, detailed view of that. And I think a lot of people, obviously, on the call here, would benefit from that type of thing, and you know, making it a lot more understandable, which you've certainly done today. Is this something that easy for a listener to? To have a go at or try and identify if this is the right sort of thing for them yeah definitely i think speaking candidly when i was before i joined demand base i said i was in, in marketing and in in martech kind of consultancy world and the the idea of intent as you say is very mysterious and it's how do we identify that account is reading that keyword and reading that content and of course my, my role here at demand base on the, the the more the engineering side of the pre-sales world I get an insight into that, right? And actually how the technology works and how we do that. And when you get into the, the detail of it and the technology, it does become you know, far, far less mysterious and a fabulous bit of uh, insight and technology that, that we provide here at the Mar base. I think that the thing there is put it to the test. If there's marketers out there or sellers out there that uh, want a greater understanding of, of intent and their accounts that might be showing intent, put it to the test. I'm sure vendors out there, including the Marbase, will be more than happy to, to, to look at that for you and, and, and see what we can find. And you'll see accounts, you'll see intent. That makes perfect sense. Right? And that's where um, you know, that, that mysteriousness nature of intent will, will become a lot clearer. And hopefully this session has put a little bit uh, to that as well, potentially. Yeah, I think it has, Matt. And I've always said that you know, if you're building a strategy, um, we also have the ABM debate. Do you start with strategy? Do you start with technology? And both of them are really important, right? But if you're building a strategy without the data to tell you who to focus on, if and how they're engaging, your strategy is really that. It's cross fingers and hope. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think this has been really useful. I hope it has for everyone else as well, demystifying a little bit around intent, what it means and how you can utilize it. But before we close out this session, a couple of fun facts about yourself, if we can, Matt. Firstly, who do you follow online? Any podcast? Anyone you'd recommend listening to that you think could be beneficial? Yes, there's a podcast, um, Demand Gen Radio uh, is the podcast there. A guy called David Lewis, who was, uh, it's now part of BDO Digital. Um, but yeah, they're a good, they're a good podcast. Uh, that, that taught me a lot in terms of marketing technology and, and, and the role of marketing and definitely well worth a follow. Uh, lots of episodes there if listeners haven't. Uh, listen to that yet to, to catch up on but um yeah they're, they're a very good uh, resource um uh, in terms of people some people will know this um but those that, that don't uh, i used to play table tennis at, at quite a, quite a decent level i mean i was no forest gump but uh, it was quite a good level here here in the uk but um 
you know, that, that was very much tested when I went down and uh, met some of my sales engineers recently out in, in San Francisco and, and didn't win the table tennis competition. So um, people perhaps didn't believe me. But when I was younger, it was a pretty decent level. But I seem to have lost my touch pool in, uh, in my years since. <laughs> Well, the one, co- one thing I can say is you don't run like Forrest Gump, so uh, I've not seen you play table tennis, but one day we'll take you up on that challenge. We've actually got a number of questions, but I thought, because we've got a couple of minutes left before we close out, one that's come in, which is quite interesting, actually, from Jake Gill. Do you think it's important to also score negative scoring? So that, you know, the fact that we sent 15 emails and no one replied, should that deduct from the score? Is that something that you've come across or would have any comment on? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I guess there's there's for and against for, for, to, for, for negative scoring versus positive. But I think if you want to just put it, zero that out, right? I think that's the critical part there. At least have it at zero, minus it if, if, if you want to. But I definitely don't give it a, a positive score. I think that's the that's the critical part there. But again, having having the control over that, whether you want to, make a score negative or, or not is uh you know is, is a critical part to that but at least at least have any engagement that you know isn't relevant at least put a zero against that right and only score positively those that you think is actually making a, a significant impact that an account is perhaps in market and ready for whatever action it might be marketing or, or sales Yeah, it makes sense. It's probably soul destroying as a salesperson to get all excited about that. Oh, they're really in market to find out that actually they've just been unsubscribing and ignoring you. But yeah, great points. Thanks, thanks, Jake, for the question. Uh, there are more questions, but unfortunately, we haven't got time to answer them on on this live session now. But we will be going back afterwards and answering the questions uh, through the LinkedIn chat. So, Matt, that's been really good. Uh, a really good session. It's taken away a lot of the the mystery for myself and hopefully for the listeners as well. I think if I had to take two main takeaways from this, firstly, don't ignore intent. If you aren't able to identify early in the buyer journey, who's in market, what buying signals they're showing, which of your clients are exploring competition or you know, showing cross-sell, upsell signals, you're effectively basing your strategy, your priorities and all of your activities on guesswork, and you're likely missing out a lot of great opportunities. And you're potentially going to lose clients that in reality you didn't need to. And finally, if you are investing intent, Take the time to dig into the detail. Find out exactly what type of intent will be surfaced, how relevant it is to your own business and how it'll, the actions that you it initiates will, will you know, work within your business. Are they valuable? Or are they going to potentially misdirect your focus and lead to wasted time, budget and resource? Intent is a vital part of anyone's strategy. So let's make sure it's the right intent for your own business. Right, that concludes today's session. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you got a lot out of it. And please look out for future episodes in the Growth Buster series. We've got titles like Stop Advertising to Companies You Can't Sell To, Metrics B2B Marketers Should Be Reporting On, Understanding the Controlling and Controlling the Buyer Journeys, and Maximizing Customer Returns. But for now, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening. And remember, we ain't afraid of no growth. <laughs>